thesis of the terraforming is that intelligent life has been designing the planet for millennia, often unintentionally and without today's global awareness. This awareness demands the recalibration of the focus of design, away from chairs, facades, and advertising, towards infrastructure, governance, and ecosystems. In essence, to the scale of the planet itself. To begin this is to reckon with the central design problem at hand, excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which could push the planet beyond two degrees of warming. To reverse this excess is not to return society to old practices by searching in vain for the emergency brake. Instead, it's to learn to steer, to focus on the source which is producing the problem in the first place, and to direct the carbon back from where it came, the deep geologic formations of the earth, to bury the sky. An investigation of the motive, techniques, and locations leads to a plan and a host of actors that might carry it through. A zone of Siberia holds an unexpected key to the long-term carbon storage problem, a rock called basalt. The region's geological foundation was laid during a great extinction event 250 million years ago, and now might help us prevent our own. Let's begin with the motive, why the sky must be drained. All IPCC pathways that limit warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees imply that we must actively remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. You can think of our atmosphere as a filled up bathtub. The tap can't be turned off because we can't stop all emissions, and so the overflowing tub needs to be drained as well. Removing CO2 from the atmosphere is our draining, and the IPCC estimates that we need to remove in the range of 100 to 1,000 gigatons of CO2 by 2100, a project that spans the course of a century. This is meant to happen in conjunction with global emissions declining starting this year, but based on current projections this is unlikely to happen for the remainder of the 2020s. Thus we have to aim for the higher end of capturing 1,000 gigatons of CO2. Aforestation and regenerative agriculture can capture carbon as well, and are sometimes referred to as passive negative emission technologies, but on their own they won't be enough. The full portfolio of passive negative emission technologies could still only capture up to 500 gigatons, and that's if we see some extreme changes to current deforestation and agricultural paradigms, and that's a big if. Additionally, passive negative emission technologies themselves are vulnerable to the effects of climate change. A bad season of wildfires can instantly release years of passively captured carbon as forests burn. With the majority of CO2 emissions coming from burned fossil fuels, 83% in 2017, most of the excess carbon in the atmosphere was mechanically extracted from deep below the Earth's surface. Which begs the question, can we use similar industrial techniques to return excess carbon to where it came from? What captures the air? Carbon capture and storage, or CCS, is the active negative emission technology we need, but it comes with its own challenges. To start, where can the carbon be captured? This can happen at point sources, such as power plants and metal refineries. Adding CCS filtration to these processes is an essential step in the emission reduction portfolio. But transporting captured carbon to a storage location generates new emissions along the way and is expensive. Direct air capture, or DAC, pulls in ambient air. CO2 is evenly distributed throughout the planet's atmosphere meaning that DAC units can be placed anywhere in proximity to a carbon-neutral power source and where the captured carbon can be stored. There are two main DAC processes, and reductively they can be described using similar terms. First, turbines pull in ambient air. The CO2 from the air is adsorbed, and the adsorbents are heated to release the CO2 as pure gas. Finally, the leftover adsorbents are treated to be reused in step two. That's DAC in a nutshell. DAC requires land, too. According to Climeworks, one gigaton of CO2 per year would require 62 square kilometers in machines alone, or 8,600 football fields. The good news is that this can be non-arable land. Once the carbon is captured, it's a question of where it can be stored. There are three main options. Depleted oil and gas reservoirs have an estimated global capacity of 675 to 900 gigatons of CO2. They unfortunately require all content to be extracted first. 
Suboceanic saltwater aquifers have an estimated global capacity of 1,000 gigatons of CO2 or more, but the majority of them are located deep beneath the ocean floor and are challenging to access. Underground rock formations are yet to have a solid capacity estimate, but the Columbia River basalt can store 100 gigatons of CO2, and there are other basalt traps 10 to 30 times larger. Capturing carbon is energy intensive, so which power source can keep this a negative emission? Bioenergy and waste heat both present challenges, but renewables are the main consideration. Hydro, solar, and wind each have their own very specific land use requirements and limitations. Hydroenergy can currently support industrial operations, but it is restricted to riverine areas, while the capture of one gigaton of CO2 would call for 2,000 square kilometers when using solar panels. That's why nuclear, despite its stigmas, is most promising for carbon capture and storage. It's carbon neutral, and small modular reactor technology, which is currently coming to market, could be easily deployed to carbon storage sites. And, unlike CO2, nuclear waste is dense, opaque, and tangible, much easier to assign ownership over. But before any of these steps can be taken, there's the question of financing. Carbon can be sold to whoever can use it in a product like synthetic fuel, construction, and even vodka. But the transport and production requirements not only create costs, but also new emissions, often negating the point of drawdown. So what viable options for capturing carbon exist within current economic paradigms? Three options present themselves. Carbon taxes, when taxed emissions can be offset with carbon capture, even for a direct fee. Carbon credits, when cap-and-trade programs allow those who stay under emission limits to earn credits, they can sell to those who need to go over. And lastly, enhanced oil recovery, or EOR, a process that uses injected gas to increase oil recovery by 30 to 60 percent. Captured carbon can be used too, and when it uses more CO2 than the recovered oil will emit, it becomes a negative emission. CO2 enhanced oil recovery could be the financial bridge that carbon capture and storage technology needs. Actively monitoring injected CO2 gas is essential to count the true negative emissions. And with the limited capacity of EOR, even with all oil and gas extracted, CO2 enhanced oil recovery alone remains insufficient. This then brings us to where the sky should go. We need a carbon sink which is long-lasting, thermodynamically stable, environmentally benign, and big enough to hold at least 1,000 gigatons. Geological formations are the only carbon sinks which satisfy these criteria, but carbon dioxide can't be injected into just any formation. The ideal formation would need to chemically convert CO2 into a solid. And luckily, this is exactly what happens in the pores of basalt. When injected in a mix with water, CO2 is converted to a mineral rock. CarbFix and CarbFix2, in partnership with Climeworks, represent the biggest practical application of this process. By the end of 2017, they successfully injected 23,200 metric tons of CO2 into the basalt of Iceland, proving that 95% of injected CO2 reacts within two years, and 60% within four months. The more porous the basalt, the faster the conversion takes place. Water requirements are significant. But with current technology, one gigaton of CO2 injection would require less than 0.6% of the world's annual fresh water use. Every continent has prominent flood basalt provinces, but each come with a unique set of challenges. Some are offshore, located beneath densely populated areas, covered in jungle, or beneath politically unstable territory. While each of the world's traps might eventually become part of the full carbon storage portfolio, the question is, which of the continental flood basalts is the largest and best suited? The Siberian Traps of Russia. The Siberian Traps are the largest continental flood basalt in the world, with an estimated storage capacity between 2,000 and 2,720 gigatons of CO2, which is at least twice our goal. The main city of the basalt region is already a major infrastructural access point, Norilsk. Beyond Norilsk, Siberia counts as many as 60 cultural groups among its inhabitants, even though large state projects often fail to take their interests into account. But as DAC units are well suited for non-arable land and can be sparsely distributed, life could continue generally unobstructed. Alternatively, 
It could offer new opportunities, whether in the form of jobs or new commerce that extends along infrastructure corridors to areas that currently have limited access. Plans to extend the rail system are already underway, based on Russia's strategic plan for 2030. But new infrastructure isn't the only change coming to the region. Permafrost, a layer of perennially frozen land, is changing as the planet warms. It will certainly pose major challenges for any infrastructural endeavor. It's clear that the challenges of Siberia are as large as its opportunities. But as Russia looks to develop its regional resources, the expertise is already focused on innovations for extreme conditions, a huge benefit for realizing direct air capture on the Siberian traps. The plan, how to bury the sky. The sky barriers would consist of four pieces of infrastructure. Thermosiphon foundation platforms, direct air capture intake turbines, small modular reactor facilities, and integrated direct injection wellheads. Similar to current state-of-the-art DAC facilities, these stations would capture one megaton of CO2 per year and need 250 meters between each station to avoid recapturing recently decarbonized air. They'd be powered by a new generation of nuclear energy that is already planned for remote Russian regions. Small modular reactors, or SMRs, can fit into shipping containers and can be transported anywhere that a boat, truck, or train can travel. Thermosiphon foundations are designed to support Arctic infrastructure. They actively circulate freezing liquid throughout the foundation structure to keep the supportive permafrost frozen. They can support industrial facilities that weigh over a million tons. Finally, injection wellheads heat the CO2 and water mixture to a high temperature before injecting into basalt, both for the efficiency of the process and to avoid frozen pipes. 1,000 gigatons of CO2 by the end of the century means an average of 12.5 gigatons per year, or 12,500 DAC stations. Of course, these can't be built overnight and would be constructed in a series of phases. Then again, the effectiveness of the technology will inevitably improve and fewer stations might eventually be required to achieve the same ends. Either way, a network of direct air capture stations would span hundreds, even thousands of kilometers across the Siberian traps, or could later be distributed between several basalt regions around the world. How does a network like this expand across the Siberian traps? Today, one in three cities in Russia are monotowns. And while Norilsk is thriving, others are plagued by degradation of the urban environment, catastrophic ecological problems, and low social mobility. But with DAC facilities needing labor too, this would usher in a new form of temporary urbanism based on the shift model with workers inhabiting cities based on production and maintenance cycles. Such systems already exist in offshore oil production, a proven model with work on a rotational basis and minimum urban functions for towns which only exist for years, rather than decades or centuries. Phase one would begin from Norilsk and deploy pilot stations based on the basalt's accessibility, porosity, and proximity to the infrastructural loading zone of the port itself, while other towns could start testing their basalt suitability. In addition to the new temporary urbanism, new infrastructural development would include two new ports around the Timur Peninsula where the infrastructural shipments for the DAC network could be received. The already proposed rail line between Norilsk and Chitanga would help establish the deployment of shift work, leading the construction and growth of new stations while providing the labor for maintenance of the existing stations as well. Phase two would see the first zones of the basalt become saturated as an additional rail line running north to south expands across the yet to be injected southern basalt. Some DAC stations might be decommissioned and moved to new locations while being upgraded to new efficiency standards exceeding their starting capacity of one megaton of CO2 per year. Over their 20 to 30 year life cycle, small modular reactor units are exchanged and replaced like cartridges, or upgraded to more efficient models. By mid-century, 50% coverage of the basalt region is reached, still adhering closely to the growing network configuration of rails, ports, and monotowns. 
Phase three concludes by 2100. The DAC network would span the entire basalt region, featuring thousands of stations continuing to bury the sky while collectively having captured 1,000 gigatons of CO2. Who takes responsibility? By now it should be self-evident that burying the sky requires a major paradigm shift. Efforts around construction, labor, and resources would have to refocus on this new goal. But in order to avoid more than two degrees of warming, burying the sky is inevitable. Who pays is a question of cost, and projecting the price of nascent technologies 80 years into the future is challenging. But in a leading comparative analysis, Climeworks' price goal of $100 per ton of CO2 is concluded to be in line with many of the other price projections for 2050. To base sky burial on this figure would be to ignore specific costs and benefits of Siberia, of nuclear SMR technology, and cost fluctuations over the century. With that in mind, assuming the majority of our goal would be reached after 2050, this gives a ballpark cost of $100 trillion to bury 1,000 gigatons of CO2 totaling $1.25 trillion per year. But trillions of dollars becomes less daunting when put in perspective. $142 trillion was the global GDP of 2019, and 30 to $50 trillion is estimated to be spent in the next 10 years on infrastructure alone. A single hurricane can cause $1 trillion of damage. The question remains, who will pay? Three precedents show a path forward. The growing global carbon market is valued at $214 billion after charting a five-fold increase between 2017 and 2019. This market will likely reach $1 trillion within the coming decade. As Russia has one of the lowest oil recovery rates, there's a big opportunity for CO2-enhanced oil recovery to become the country's catalyst for carbon capture. This growing carbon market could easily incentivize Russia to become the exclusive operator of a leading sequestration region. Initial investments into the region may come from outside of Russia. In recent years, China has invested several billion dollars to develop agricultural projects between their key farming belts in Russia's Far East. South Korean Lock Corporation also grew its land rental holdings in the region to 150,000 hectares. This land lease structure could easily apply to carbon capture infrastructure. Russia is positioned to create a land rental system that provides the basic infrastructure to operationalize the territory for carbon capture and storage. While these initial financial structures might catalyze the development, the total goal would imply the major powers of the world collaborating on a multinational research and development endeavor. The prospect of future damages due to climate change looms large, yet the costs of solving them are too high for any single country to accomplish on its own. The International Space Station, the ITER Fusion Project, and the 30-meter telescope are planetary-scale precedent projects made possible only through international coordination. Multiple countries contribute proportionate value and expertise to the project, and every nation collectively benefits. When each nation can prove that their economic contribution to the carbon drawdown project is less than the net cost of climate change to their domestic economy, then contribution is not just merited, but should be outright demanded. The Siberian traps are the geologic remains of the single greatest extinction event in the history of complex life on Earth, known as the Great Dying. Siberian volcanic activity 250 million years ago released tens of thousands of gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere, killing 95% of life. It marked the end of the Permian Age and the beginning of the Triassic, covering the region in porous black rock as surface lava cooled. Today we find ourselves in the midst of yet another great extinction event, happening slowly, right as we speak. While a multitude of solutions will be required to sustain life and curb the warming, direct air capture is the key to driving excess carbon back into the Earth's crust. Now, the basalt of the Siberian traps can inhabit the role of savior as opposed to destroyer, ingesting the very substance it once spat out. This is To Bury the Sky.